Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on environmental theology and ethics of the Jewish Science and Medicine Group uh, meeting. This uh, session, we have uh, three presenters. I will present them their introductions first, one at a time, and then they'll speak for 15 to 20 minutes. Then we'll move on to the second and then to the third speaker. And then we'll have time for a Q&A. You should have the Q&A function at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. If you have trouble with it, you can also use uh, the chat uh, box as well. And we'll handle all those uh, questions and comments after the presenters have finished their uh, three presentations. Our first presenter today is uh, Rabbi Ellen Bernstein, a eco-theologian, spiritual leader and writer and creator. Uh, she founded the Shomrei uh, Adama uh, Keepers of the Earth Group, the first national Jewish environmental organization back in 1988. And she's been uh, re recognized as a leader who helps to launch the field of religion and ecology more generally, illuminate the Hebrew biblical uh, ecological uh, language and a creative uh, foundation for Jewish ecological thought. She's written a number of uh, books, foundational years ago, and most recently her uh, book that just came out and I just learned about, so we'll be ordering it for my Seder, uh, a new book put out by Berman House, The Promise of the Land, a Passover Haggadah uh, that uh, is available now. And if you want to learn more of her about her, you can go to her own uh, website at ellenbernstein.org. My pleasure to introduce uh, Rabbi Ellen Bernstein, who will be speaking on a biblical echo theology. Rabbi Bernstein. Thanks so much. And thank you to Hava for uh, creating this conference and inviting me. And it's, I'm delighted to be here with my co-panelists. This talk is titled A Biblical Eco Theology. However, it may have been better titled The Bible's Ecological Language, or maybe even The Bible's Ecological Story, given our last conversation. I believe that language is the beginning of culture. Language narrates and molds our perception. Language can help open us up to new experience and shape the impact of our experiences. Today, we need meaningful and robust language to connect us more organically with the natural world and to inspire us to care for her. We need a more nuanced ecological language to help us cultivate a universal ecological culture. Contemporary environmental language can be too flat and sometimes too moralistic and is often more transactional than poetic. People are suffering from green fatigue and can't bear to he hear any more devastating news. And today our world is so polarized that even words like environmentalist and climate are politicized and they can alienate the people we most need to reach. I've often thought that the way that we communicate the environmental message is as important as the message itself. As philosopher Marshall McLuhan wrote in 1964, the medium is the message. Biblical language has been a source of inspiration to writers and thinkers throughout history, and it has been a source of inspiration to me. I believe it can help us today, and I've spent my career trying to tap into the Bible's literary vein for its ecological ideas. There's a well-known book called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. I always love this title, and I've had a similar feeling about the Hebrew Bible. Almost all I really needed to know when it comes to ecology, I learned in Genesis 1, the first chapter of the Hebrew Bible, which many would cons consider the equivalent of kindergarten. But just like kindergarten, which people often don't take seriously, Genesis 1 is often overlooked as a source of essential wisdom, and in this case, ecological wisdom and language. So I'm going to try to share my screen here. And. Okay, you can see this, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're going to start with uh, just, uh, we're going to start by exploring a few words that comprise the ecological vocabulary of Genesis 1. 
So let's start with the second line of the Bible's creation story, which we have here. I'm just going to move my screen up a little bit. Okay. So we have this in the second line of the Bible's creation story in the beginning, uh, we hear that Ruach Elohim, the wind of God hovered over the surface of the waters. Our, in, our first encounter with God is as the wind, the air. Ruach is this beautifully multi-layered word in Torah. Ruach is the wind and it's also the breath the place where the breath from inside our lungs meets the outside atmosphere. And Ruach, of course, can also mean spirit. So it's the place where God, breath, and wind coincide. Ruach is used over and over in Torah, intertwining these three meanings, wind, breath, and the divine. Since God, the breath, and the wind are all bound up together, when we contaminate our air, we're contaminating God, chasing God away, and when we engage in restorative activities like gardening and farming and tree planting, when we rebuild the soil, which acts as a carbon sink, and plant trees, which will capture carbon and turn it into tree flesh, we're intentionally exchanging carbon for oxygen, and we're building a temple for God, a temple that God can inhabit, a temple where God can breathe. Thinking about the air as Ruach Elohim can profoundly change the way we think about the atmosphere and climate change and our own lives. The element or habitat earth is also deeply rooted in Genesis 1. On the third day, the text proclaims, let the earth bring forth vegetation. Genesis is not the sole agent of creation here. The earth has agency. She partners with God in bringing forth. The earth has the ability to grow the creatures that will inhabit her. She is generative. She is prolific. She is alive. The 12th century uh, rabbinic commentator Nachmanides notes that the Hebrew word for earth, aretz, suggests a force that can, causes growth. The ecological idea of sustainability or flourishing also runs through the language of Genesis 1. Just want to make sure you can see this here. Yeah, okay. Um, sustainability is communicated in several ways. First, through the focus on seeds on the third day in Genesis 1, 11 to 12. The plants will seed seeds and fruit trees will make fruit with seeds in them. Seeds are, after all, the way that life sustains itself from one generation to the next. The word zera in various forms is repeated six times in these two verses, calling our attention to seeds. Seeds are significant. Sustainability is also communicated through the phrase, after its kind, used, re used repeatedly throughout Genesis 1, pointing to the necessity to perpetuate the species line. The blessing given to the fish and the birds and humans for fertility in 122 and 28 is another insurance that the species line will continue. Perhaps the most ecologically potent word embedded in the primary trope of the creation story is the word tov or good. Everything, every aspect of creation is designated tov or good. The light is tov, the water, the air, the earth, the trees, the vegetation, the stars, the planets, the fish and the birds and the land animals, they're all tov. Environmental ethicists are primarily concerned with the value that we attribute to the natural world. They distinguish between instrumental and intrinsic value. Instrumental value is the practical value that things or nature can provide. Instrumental value assumes that nature exists for us to use for our own ends. Intrinsic value, on the other hand, is the value that creatures have in and of themselves as ends in themselves, whether or not we humans deem them useful or valuable. In Genesis 1, the goodness of the wild and diverse, biodiverse world, the toveness is the preeminent value. The rabbi philosopher physician Maimonides writing in the 12th century 
said that the goodness of all the creatures is a testament to their intrinsic value. Each organism has integrity, each contributes to the whole and is required for the whole. The world is built on the foundation of the goodness of the creatures without which it could not exist. Just wanna make sure that you can see these. One second. The theme of the goodness of creation culminates on the sixth day when the very goodness of everything is realized. Each individual creation was called good and now all the creatures, everything all together is deemed very good. Commentators and many readers of the text have long presumed that the de designation of very goodness on the sixth day referred to the human creatures who were created, created on that day. They assumed that humanity was the crown of creation and that creation was established solely for people to use for their own benefit. But on the sixth day, it's all the creatures, the interconnected world of earth, water, air, plants, and walking, swimming, and flying creatures that is seen by God as very good. The ultimate in goodness is the interdependent world. There's a sense of indivisibility of all the creatures involved as one living, breathing whole. Every organism is bound up in the life of every other organism. There's lots more I could say about Genesis 1's ecological vocabulary. Indeed, I wrote a whole book on it, but I wanna make sure to leave time for the discussion of humanity's role in creation. On the sixth day, when humanity was created last after all the rest, God gives us mastery over the earth and rulership or dominion over the other creatures. Tragically, many have read this verse to mean that God gave humanity a mandate to dominate and exploit nature, and they blame the Bible for the environmental crisis. This idea of dominion as domination is what I was taught 45 years ago when I was a college student at Berkeley, and this reading continues to be taught in environmental studies courses today. But if you read the context of Genesis 1 as we've been reading it, as the farmer poet Wendell Berry would say, why would God wanna give humanity a mandate to exploit nature after God worked so intentionally to create such a beautiful world, a world that could sustain itself on its own in perpetuity without any help from humanity? No, dominion is the language that Torah uses to express our responsibility towards the earth. And dominion, the commandment to care for the earth is our very first commandment. Theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes poignantly of an intimacy between humankind and the creatures, stressing a most loving dominion. He wrote, the ground and the animals over which I have dominion constitute the world in which I live, without which I would cease to be. Created last, the human creature is vulnerable and depends on all the other creatures in order to survive. Bonhoeffer continues, in my whole being, in my creatureliness, I belong to this world. It bears me, it nurtures me, it holds me. It is my world, my earth over which I rule. Bonhoeffer uses the word my here, not in terms of possession, but my in terms of relationship and in terms of belonging. He is reflecting the sentiment of the Bible where there is no concept for human ownership, rather, Dominion implies a deep connection, a communion with nature. The Bible itself hints that dominion is not given to people arbitrarily. Dominion is conditional. It is given and can be taken away. The human word for dominion, reish dalad hay, points to this, excuse me, the Hebrew word for dominion, reish dalad hay, points to this conditionality. In, in certain forms, reish dalad hay looks exactly like another Hebrew word, yud reish dalad, to go down. Rashi, the foremost medieval rab rabbinic commentator, points out the wordplay inherent in this three-letter root and it explains that if we consciously embody God's image, if we stand upright and rule responsibly with wisdom and compassion, we will reish dalad hay have dominion over the creatures, ensuring a world of harmony. 
But if we deny our responsibility to the creation and thoughtlessly take advantage of our position and the creation, we will yudresh dalit, yarad, go down below the other creatures and bring ruin to ourselves and to the world. If we upend the blessing to further selfish goals, the blessing becomes a curse. It is upon us to choose. Some of the rabbinic sages suggested that dominion over the earth first requires dominion over ourselves. They suggested that people must have dominion over their own desires and master the tendency towards gluttony. More than 60 years ago, Rachel Car Carson captured this sentiment when she wrote, we in this generation must come to terms with nature. We're challenged as humankind has never been challenged before to prove our maturity and mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. Of course, Genesis 1 doesn't give us a complete ego theology, but it does offer a strong foundation. In the early days of the Jewish environmental movement, many of us scoured the Hebrew Bible and other Jewish texts, identifying particular verses or ideas as ecological. But a collection of verses does not constitute a worldview. I always intuited there must be some ecological idea that connected all the disparate nuggets of ecological wisdom that we had found throughout the Torah. I imagine that the whole, create, the whole creation as a tree of life that went underground after it first appeared, its roots stretching out through the soil of the text, sprouting up here and there throughout the narrative, offering shade and respite and a reminder of the creation. I'd always been captivated by the deep connection between human and the earth that was captured by the, human la the Hebrew language. The very similarity of the Hebrew words for person and land, Adam and Adama, attest to our intimate connection to the land, to the earth. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are bound to their lush, beautiful, earthy home, and a sense of wholeness permeates Eden. This intimacy between Adam and Adama, between person and land, breaks down when the couple takes the fruit of the forbidden tree when they take what doesn't belong to them and they're immediately exiled from the paradisial land. They lose their connection to God and they find themselves in a barren landscape. In the next story, Cain, a farmer, and Abel, a herder, are similarly bound to the land. But when Cain kills Abel, Cain is cut off from the land and condemned to spend the rest of his life in exile, placeless, rootless, a wanderer. The very early Genesis stories were stories of landedness and landlessness. Behaving badly always led to exile from the land, from the earth. I realized I needed to take the whole idea of land more seriously. Ecologically speaking, land is a fundamental concept. The land is an interdependent ecosystem of soils, waters, plants, animals, and us. Land is the community to which we belong. It is our habitat and we are its inhabitants. Farmers have always known the value of land. Agrarian author Wendell Berry famously wrote, if you have no land, you have nothing, no food, no shelter, no warmth, no freedom, no life. Curious about the land's place in the Bible, I did a quick word search and was surprised to find that the word Eretz, which means both land and earth, occurs over 2000 times in the Bible and the word Adama, uh, which also refers to land and soil, appears a few hundred times. With more study, I began to understand the whole Torah, starting with the Garden of Eden, as a universal story of a people and a land. In the beginning, we were wanderers, landless. Then God made a promise to Abraham and to Isaac after him and to Jacob and all the generations that we would inherit a land that we could call home. There could be no greater blessing than land. Land in the Bible is never just material, inert stuff. It is the source of our lives and the length of our days. The episode in the wilderness teaches a deep lesson about the land. En route to the promised land, we would endure 400 years in Egypt where Pharaoh owned the land and exploited the land and everyone in it. For, for Pharaoh, land had no inherent value. It was a commodity. 
Utilizing slave labor, Pharaoh increased the land's agricultural output, amassing more and more wealth for the royal coffers. Living so land, long in Pharaoh's exploitive economy, we would come to forget the meaning of land. If God were to give us a land, we would need to recognize the land's incomparable value. God took us to the wilderness for 40 years to teach us that the land, the earth, was not a thing. It was not ours to acquire, and it was not guaranteed. The earth belongs to God. We would only inherit the land, the earth, as temporary residents if we honored our covenant with God by living good, wholesome, and righteous lives. If we behaved unethically or irresponsibly toward each other, the land, or God, our negativity would generate an energetic pollution that could cause God to shut up the sky so there would be no rain. The land would dry up and the earth would not yield its produce and we would perish from the land we were promised. This is the ultimate meaning of the Shema, the central prayer of the Jewish people. I was intrigued by how the Torah's idea of interdependence of people, land, and God mirrored nature's cycles and feedback loops and how our current climate crisis mirrors the Torah's understanding of reality. Land, people, and God were imperceptibly bound in a three-way covenant relationship knit together as one. The way we behave towards each other and the way we treat the land has consequences for all the creatures, the land, the water, the air, and our future. Recognizing the Bible as a universal story about a people and a land offers us a powerful mythology and a rich language that can help us navigate our way to live more harmoniously on this earth. If we read the Torah with this sensibility, I believe we would expand our identity as Jews and find new ways to live with the earth in mind, in heart, and in the practices of our hands. These days, many young Jews in particular have an intuitive connection to the land and have been expressing their ecological and Jewish consciousness in gardening and farming and other activities to help restore the land. Many would argue that regenerative farming techniques are the most powerful antidote to climate change. I believe that the Jewish farming movement is the most exciting and hopeful development in the Jewish community today. Abundance Farm, the farm at the synagogue where I used to live in Northampton, Mass, grows tons of food, feeds those in need, protects the soil, sequesters carbon, and engages hundreds of unaffiliated Jews in Jewish life and care for the earth. Furthermore, the synagogue is so much more robust now since the farm was introduced, filled with crowds of children frolicking in our gardens. It models what it means to be a religious community in the 21st century. People naturally learn to care for their own plot of land and widen the circle of caring to include the larger community and the whole earth. I want to close with some words from the great farmer poet Wendell Berry. He wrote, we don't have a right to ask whether we're going to succeed or not. The right question to ask is, what does the earth require of us if we want to continue to live on her? Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for your very provocative words and words of Torah. And uh, let me uh, again reiterate that uh, you're most welcome to post your questions now if you have a question specifically for Ellen, and we'll get to them after our next two speakers. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Evan Mays, and Rabbi Evan Mays, Ariel Evan Mays, who's uh, joined the faculty of Stanford at 2017 as an assistant professor of religious studies. And he serves as the rabbi in residence of the Atik Jewish uh, Maker Institute. He previously was the director of Jewish studies and visiting assistant professor at uh, Modern Jewish Thought at Hebrew College in Boston. He received his PhD from Harvard, rabbinic ordination uh, from Beit Midrash uh, Harel in Israel and has uh, three books that are, have come out or are coming out this year, including among them, uh, Speaking Infinities, God and the Language of Torah, 
for for Rab for, from the teachings of Rabbi Dober of Meserich. Uh, his talk today is entitled "Voices from Tradition: Modern Jewish Spirituality and Theological Responses to Climate Change." Rabbi Dr. Mays, thank you. Thank you so much for that very very kind introduction. Um, thank you, Chava, for this warm invitation. Thank you, Lisa, for making all of this happen. Um, I begin, as always, with a land acknowledgement that I come to you from Berkeley, the traditional lands of the Muekma Ohlone peoples who lived in community with these lands for many generations. I am trying to share my screen and I'm hoping that it will be successful. So far, so good. Fantastic. It's a miracle every time it works. So for the past five decades, Jewish intellectuals, activists, and others have been looking to the past in order to formulate a system of environmental ethics that can sustain us into the future. Some have seen their work as rooted primarily in the Hebrew Bible, in its laws and narratives, taking up the visions of the Sabbath, the sabbatical year, or the creation story, or the glowing appreciation of the natural world found in Psalms. We heard a little bit of that from Ellen just a few minutes ago. Others, including myself, and we'll hear about this in just a few minutes from uh, Professor Yore, have looked to the rabbinic tradition and the rabbinic literatures, including Jewish law called halacha and the landscapes of legend and lore called agadah. This attempt seeks to trace veins of rabbinic thought into later codes and writings in an attempt to mobilize Jewish visions of obligation to correct the rights-oriented paradigm that dominates much of Western discourse. Still others look to the medieval rationalists or to the early modern thinkers whose worldviews offer alternatives to the epistemologies and economic visions that have led to instrumental reason, carbon capitalism, and the reduction of ethics to an individual personal moral journey. Joining with those who seek to move beyond the simplistic keywords approach, like how do you say stewardship in Jewish? Today, I'd like to think together regarding the 20th century Jewish intellectuals who drew deeply from the worlds of Jewish mysticism. And we'll look at two of them in particular. The first is Rabbi Zalman Shechter Shalomi, known to all of his friends and disciples as Reb Zalman. And the, Israeli, the second is the Israeli poet Z Zelda Schneerson Mishkovsky, known always as Zelda. My constructive argument is that both of these remarkable individuals provide us with a helpful and complementary models for rethinking environmental ethics and the paradigms behind them. So what is Kabbalah, this world of Jewish mysticism that they have inherited? It's an intellectual strain that stretches into antiquity and from there into the medieval world, though the Kabbalists themselves describe their theological systems as a continuation of the revelation at Sinai. It's a continuous river of discourse, united by a shared commitment to canonical Jewish texts. First and foremost, that means the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, and to a lesser extent, that means the Talmud and rabbinic Midrashim. The writings of Jewish mystics employ a rich matrix of associations and symbols inspired by biblical verses or rabbinic teachings, which are expanded and redefined over the years. Some of these have taken on a relatively recognizable form in the early medieval period, starting in the 12th or 13th centuries, crystallizing around the Svirot, the term Svira in the singular, which are the form or the sort of core of this language. The Svirot are understood as a kind of um, series of emanations that bridge between the abstract unknowable divine and the imminent godly presence in this world. The Sfirot are also the anchors to which this vast array of mystical symbols adheres. And this language, this vibrant language of linguistic and conceptual associations is one of this tradition's greatest contribu contributions to Jewish religious thought. The layered descriptions of Jewish mysticism is unfinished, however, because of the ongoing creativity of Jewish mystics and their capacious ability to absorb new ideas vocabularies and worldviews, whether scientific, philosophical, or literary, and others, and to metabolize these in an effort to explore and preserve the world's upper and inner. So to turn to our first thinker, the late Rabbi Zalman Shechter Shalomi, or Reb Zalman, um, 
stood within him this river of discourse, engaging with it creatively and passing it on to his disciples. Reb Zalman, as he was always known, was a creative thinker and a dynamic spiritual teacher. Born in Poland but raised in Vienna, he came of age in a diverse Jewish environment with family connections to the Hasidic world. His family passed through Belgium and France to escape the Nazis, eventually moving to America, where he became close to the leadership of the Chabad Lubavitch Hasidic community in New York, who recognized his intellect as well as his charismatic talents. He enjoyed a short career as a shaliach, or as a kind of emissary or missionary for that group. But by the 1960s, exposure to other faith traditions, to the elan of American counterculture movement, and to a certain degree, to LSD, changed his understanding of Jewish spirituality forever. Um, the picture in the middle here, which is a priceless one, um, was taken either just after or right around the time of his first acid trip with Timothy Leary. He devoted the next 50 years of his life to inspiring a spiritual awakening amongst North American Jews, founding a series of small devotional fellowships that eventually coalesced into the spiritualist movement known as Jewish Renewal, capital J, capital R. These, um, influential revivalist movement was grounded in his ever-evolving reinterpretation of the mystical legacy of Hasidism, an 18th century mystical movement, and Kabbalah. His career unfolds across several different stages. Up until the late 1960s, more or less, he's defined by his commitments to Hasidism and then apologetics in favor of orthodoxy or orthopraxy. But by the second stage, which lasts from the late 60s all the way until the late 90s, he had become daringly and unabashedly um, anti-traditional in certain respects, although dialectically locked to the mystical tradition from which he came. He made an unmade, Traditionals in light, traditional rituals in light of ecology, transpersonal psychology, and New Age spirituality mixed together with his reading of Hasidic devotion and Kabbalistic metaphysics. He also opened the door to a kind of religious syncretism, a fact about which even some of his more radical Jewish fellow travelers expressed discontent. In his later decades, however, he moved back to a somewhat more traditional pattern of observance and praxis without relinquishing the core of the radical spiritual vision of his youth and his middle years. A key dimension of this legacy developed, especially in the second and third stages of his thought, was an attempt to reconsider issues of environmental ethics from the perspective of Jewish mysticism. Now, Reb Zalman used the notion of paradigm shift to describe the process of rethinking Judaism as a living force representing the values of spiritual intuition, cosmic harmony, and organismic integration. I'm not going to read all of these poll quotes that I've put for you. Um, when you get bored of listening to me, you can read the real wisdom on your screen. Part of the work in this new era or new epoch, as he saw it, was to rethink the mores and the boundaries of Judaism in light of a global shift in human consciousness and a new metaphysical awareness. This change necessitates a sense of kinship, a sense of interconnectedness and even interbeing between all forms of life and indeed with the earth itself. You see this in the last bit of the paragraph here where Reb Zalman notes that what's coming down now is the issue of ecology and the awareness that this earth is not a dead hunk of matter, the earth is alive. Good. This had implications for a kind of interfaith or inter-inclusive way of looking at human beings. Um, that is to say, it's the direct result of what he called erecting or perhaps revealing semi-permeable membranes between the various parts of the vital body of human life. A universal or universalistic environmental ethic, thought Reb Zalman, must grow forth out of the specific wisdom and the specific experience. And even at his most footloose, Reb Zalman sought to build a radical Judaism that was both backwards compatible, that's a phrase he used a lot, and whose distinctiveness was not effaced by syncretism or synthesis. That was his struggle. I'm not sure that he was always successful on this, but here you have a vision from one of his later writings that Judaism can no longer afford to see itself as the only valid religious tradition and that Jews must live into their, as it were, their own religious tradition to, um, to fill their destiny as a part of the mosaic, or eventually he came to describe this as a kind of living body of humanity. Um, 
Reb Zalman knew that this was not just a theoretical truth, or he came to see this not only as a theoretical truth, and he was open to and indeed excited about learning from other religious communities and indigenous wisdom traditions. Um, in some ways, this had an impact on his own practice. He was inducted into at least two different Sufi orders um, and founded another. Um, he took communion occasionally and tried to understand what it was like to be at the throbbing heart of other religious traditions. And yet, he also understood that the boundaries although semi-permeable, needed to remain in place. Here you have a reflection from an essay in the 1980s about the way in which the Jews have, have to, in the sense of ought to and should and must, learn from other kinds of wisdom traditions in indigenous communities. All of this was not simply an issue of ideology. Um, Reb Zalman, coming from Chabad, um, from this particular religious tradition was want often to quote this famous phrase, lo ha uh, midrasha ikar ela ha maase, that the most important thing is not only what you think or what you learn, but what you do. Um, in 1962, from 1962 to 64, he worked each summer at a Jewish summer camp in New England under the title of religious environmentalist. And at this time, he began to argue that halakha, the traditions of Jewish law, must evolve in light of modern ecological concerns. By the 1980s, he was making programmatic claims regarding the whole of the halakha, suggesting that we revise dietary laws in order to emphasize the values of sustainability, environmental stewardship, and care for animal welfare. In part, his interest in rethinking such categories was sparked by Abraham Joshua Heschel, who famously posed the question to his students and then eventually to his readership as to whether or not the atom bomb could, could be considered kosher. This led Reb Zalman to think in terms of eco-kosher, what he coined as eco-kosher. This means the extension of existing categories within Jewish thought, as well as the rereading of older practices. And it's an attempt to ground his metaphysics in a system of praxis. Here, you can have, you get, um, get a sense of how he was thinking about that um, in the 90s, and how the Gaia principle should be used to redetermine the cores of Jewish observance. So this was what Reb Zalman set out to accomplish, to rework the whole grid of halakha, as it were, toward the aims of cosmic and terrestrial harmony, through opening up of categories to address these central problems. Here he suggests extending the concept of idolatry to include toxic things, and pollution. He suggests the FDA as a regulatory, uh, a new kind of regulatory um, body for kashrut supervision, which I think we could quibble with on all sorts of different ways. But I think the sentiment there is fairly clear that it's not simply how long someone's beard is and what they are looking at um, that determines whether or not something is kosher, but the way in which this product and the process and the consumption and all of the systems and food ways around it impact the world and the people in that world. These are the arbiters upon wh uh, of, of whether or not something should be considered kosher. And then he kind of slips it in at the end. You'll note that he has this interesting moment in which he says that we have arrived at a moment where we need to encourage both Jews and everyone else to keep kosher. So here you have a uh, uh, um, um, an instance in which you have an illustration of Reb Zalman's particular vision seeking to become expanded, seeking to become universalized to a certain degree while effacing, diff but through effacing the difference, but um, without under, um, undercutting the core of what that praxis meant to do. So Reb Zalman had many different sources of inspiration. Here are just a few that he quotes often in his writings. Um, the bottom two often go unacknowledged, but it's a very important part of his legacy. And thinking about Chabad Hasidism, which is a particular thrust within Hasidic mysticism, I'd like to highlight three core themes that you find in Reb Zalman's writings that come directly from the mystical tradition from which he was bridging forth. The first is a kind of radical imminence, pantheism, panentheism. We could have an interesting conversation about this and a cosmism and the difference between this vision and Spinoza, but it's not exactly for now. Here, the point is that care for the physical world 
meaning ethical care, is grounded in a belief that God's presence is manifest precisely through this world. In, in later years, meaning in recent years, Reb Zalman spoke more about shechina, about malchut, about God's radical imminent present, presence than in than Keter, the kind of highest form of ecstatic worship that he was drawn to in the 70s and 80s. Undergirding this, here the quote from an 18th, early 19th century source, the blessed creator made everything and is everything in each moment without ever ceasing, God bestows blessing upon God's creatures and upon the worlds above and below. God is perfect and all inclusive. There is no separation at root as in the tree of life image so beloved to the Kabbalists, there is no separation at root between the human beings and the non-human world of which we are a part. All are manifestations of this beautiful and ever unfolding project of divinity. Now, the second is that God's presence is also a matter of human agency. How we act in this world is a matter of cosmic, and theurgic flourishing. As Howard Smith so eloquently pointed out just a few moments ago, the Kabbalists argued that the worlds above depend on those below. God needs human action. Here it's articulated in the kind of mythos of God desiring a dwelling place down below. And that dwelling place is orchestrated and created through the works of human hands. Divine imminence is not something to be taken for granted, but a kind of redemption of God, God's self. The final theme that we have to pay attention to is this kind of telos of transformation that you find in 20th century Chabad thinking that was very important for him. A tendency or a trend drawing toward ever increasing rings of unity and in concentric circles of being that leads closer and closer and closer to this kind of almost Aquarian as he had it, indeed Aquarian, revelation of a new mode of consciousness. This grows directly out of the tradition whence he came. Now, what are the strengths of this approach? There are many. An ethics of responsibility, and it underscores connectivity and kinship relations. It's not about rights, but about virtues twinned with obligation. You can read the rest of these. I think there's a lot here. As a kind of post-Holocaust theology, it offers a lot of hope. Um, and it's a kind of future-oriented ethics that allows us to think beyond the categories of the present. There are also some weaknesses. Much of this is subjective. It privileges individual choice and experience. Um, it speaks in very grand narratives. It's metaphysically committed, and it assumes a theory of progress. And as I said, I think Reb Zalman is not always entirely successful in thinking about the ways in which the specific is indeed effaced by the universal. So as I begin to draw these threads to a conclusion, um, I'd like to think about a very different inheritor of the Jewish mystical tradition who receives much less airtime in America than in Israel and receives relatively little attention in the worlds of Jewish eco poetics or eco criticism, but I think there's a lot left to be done. Marsha Falk has done a little bit of work here, but there's much left to be done. And that is the work of Rabbi of Zelda Schneerson Mishkovsky, um, who is known to many simply as Zelda. She's an Israeli poet, teacher, and artist. I'm going to put her words on the on the board here. You can read them. Um, I'll scroll through them slowly. Um, she's born in Ukraine. She moves to Palestine with her family in early adolescence and spends most of her adult life in Jerusalem. She studies painting at the Pizzalel Academy and teaches primary school in the neighborhood of Kerem Avraham. Her first collection of poetry is published only in 1968, but it's swiftly embraced by the largely secular literary world of Israel. All of her works are characterized by the same evocative style, combining the pathos of Hasidic devotion with an intuitive poetic vision and striking literary sensitivity toward the specific beauties and complexities of the natural world. The mystical richness of her poetry stems at least in part from her spiritual background. She's the direct descendant of several prominent leaders from within the Chabad Hasidic community, including that movement's founder and Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, um, the author of the text that we just looked at from Reb Zalman about the telos of creation, was her first cousin. She comes from this world, and she uses that ancient vocabulary to build a new poetic vision, reinterpreting and transforming the Hasidic past 
through a new literary key. She intuits a truth about the world, claims scholar and poet Marsha Falk and the translator of the wonderful versions that you have in front of you that cannot be expressed strictly in terms of the theological system that she inherited. She speaks in torn acknowledgement of the complexity of life, whispering of a radical awareness that God is veiled and absent and revealed through non-human and ordinary phenomena. Her language is dazzling and troubling. These, uh, my argument here is constructive in that although she did not present herself as a kind of eco poet without grand metaphysics or radical theological upheavals, she is trying to pay a, draw our attention to embodied phenomena and the appreciation of small things as both resplendent and terrifying. Zelda's work sunders binaries and rethinks hierarchies, reminding the reader that as human beings, we inhabit a more than human world in which the spiritual and the physical are entirely intertwined. Her, our writings refuse to acknowledge human alienation from the world around us, even as they decry the cruel and insipid treatment of trees, of animals, and of the physical landscape. To say it more strongly, they provide a vivid poetic articulation of the absolute co-construction of human, animal, and vegetative life. Marcia Falk recalls a story about asking Zelda regarding the meaning behind one of the images in her poems. In this case, it was a golden fish. You could ask it about the orange butterfly as well. Pointing to a blossoming plant, Zelda responded, see that plant in the window? It doesn't speak. She paused briefly before continuing. Is it any less a miracle than a plant that speaks? The climate crisis will not be countered through knowledge and facts, nor as Professor Gottlieb argued, through screaming and guilt. It requires us to create new narratives or better to develop an old new language bound to ethical practices of mind and body that shape our body as our, our behavior as individuals, communities, and as a civilization. Reb Zalman's reworking in grand narratives and this talk of paradigm shifts, together with Zelda's sensitive attention to the commanding power of the quotidian, the mundane, the simple, provide contrasting but complementary visions of how to raise up aspects of Jewish mysticism to address our present situation. Thinking constructively as one who follows in their footsteps, both have something to offer. The intellectual whirlwind of ontological flurry is thus joined to the quiet, still voice of the poet. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Ariel, for a very uh, for, uh, interesting uh, uh, presentation covering a range of uh, contemporary Jewish uh, spiritual mystical thinkers and showing how that uh, strand of Jewish tradition can be brought to bear on the discussions of ecology, as well as perhaps some of its own uh, limitations. Uh, th our third speaker uh, now is uh, Tanchum Yoreh, who is an assistant professor of the School, Environmental, School of Environment at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on religion and environment, faith-based environmentalism, Jewish environmentalism, uh, and uh, he is uh, particularly interested in questions of wastefulness, consumption, and simplicity. He is currently researching environmental engagement in the faith communities in Canada, the United States, and Israel. And he's the author of the book, Waste Not, A Jewish Environmental Ethic. His talk this afternoon is entitled, The Environment and Halachic Decision-Making, Self-Interest and Compassion. Dr. Yoreh. Thank you so much, uh, friends. I'm very pleased to join you. I'd just like to first thank uh, Chava and uh, and the organizers of the conference, Lisa, and, and uh, everyone who's uh, spoken words of wisdom today and shared them in the chats. There's been uh, a lot of richness here. Uh, I'm joining you from, from Toronto, and I'm currently in my office at the University of Toronto, and uh, for thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to be able to join you from this land. 
So I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. So uh, what am I going to speak about today? I'm going to start with the barriers to halakhically driven environmental decision making. Uh, and when I say halakhic here, I'm going to focus essentially on orthodox environmental decision making. I'm going to talk about, uh, expand one of those barriers, which are which is uh, viewing environmental protection as an extra legal matter. I'm going to talk about a potential, a theoretical source for this type of uh, approach and a way forward to perhaps uh, a, uh, a broader decision-making process within this world. So some classic barriers, and if you want to look at barriers to environmentalism in faith communities, just uh, you know, take a look at the work of uh, Veldman Satz and Haluza Delay, who uh, you know, list classic barriers like lack of interest from leadership, lack of interest from the, uh, the lay community, uh, a focus on positive imaginaries uh, of the future instead of doomsday scenarios, uh, concern with otherworldly things and not worldly things. Uh, or antithetical worldviews, uh, and uh, I'll get into some of that uh, in a bit. I want to focus on some, some things that are uniquely uh, Jewish in the sense of environmental decision-making, and one of that is the lack of decisions that have been made. Uh, we, there's a lot of uh, drawing on precedents in the uh, Jewish world, looking at past decisions and informing current ones. And if you look for environmental decisions that were made with uh, the focus of, uh, of the environment on, on the environment, we find that uh, there's very little. Uh, it's, a, it's a very stark landscape. And uh, you know, 20 years ago, Manfred Gerstenfeld you know, highlighted this as an area that uh, if we want uh, if we want people in Jewish and Orthodox communities to consider the environment, this is an area that needs to be expanded greatly. And uh, 20 years later, there's still uh, a serious dearth of people who are addressing this issue. There's also a lack of awareness. Uh, some of the things that I've encountered when I'm sort of doing my searches of, of decisions that have been made in, in, uh, in these worlds are uh, that there is a, a complete lack of awareness of some of the environmental issues that are uh, uh, present in today's world. I'll point you to just one uh, that I focused on uh, in my book as well, and that is a decision that's uh, presented to us by, by Moshe Yitzchak Vorhand, who is an ultra-Orthodox rabbi living in, in Jerusalem, who addresses the issue of disposable dishes uh, and the question that's asked is, is it necessary to reuse a disposable dish or would uh, throwing it away be a transgression of the prohibition against wastefulness? And beforehand responds that no, this is the purpose of such a dish. It's meant to be a one use item. Throwing it away would be uh, would not be a transgression of Baal Tashkid, the Jewish prohibition against wastefulness. And of course, if we come at this as environmentalists, the question is, is, seems a little off. We would ask the question much differently. Is the use of the disposable dish to begin with a transgression of the prohibition against wastefulness? And there's many other such examples. The discourse just seems to be uh, out of sync with, uh, with these different worlds. Another barrier is the magnitude of the issues. Uh, some of you will be familiar with, uh, with you know, there's a number of, of issues that come in from the Jewish world here, but some of you will be familiar with, uh, with this one coming in from the Talmud, uh, which is uh, and that's essentially translated as edicts that the, the public cannot uphold are not made. And the magnitude of environmental issues means changing everything, not just about our daily lives, if we take these things seriously, 
but also changing the systems that we live in that uh, coerce us to make decisions that we wouldn't necessarily make otherwise. And then there is the issue of worldviews. And this is really, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of worldviews. And if you want to see someone who's expanded on these, take a look at the work of Rabbi Ronan Lubitsch, uh, who's talked about this from a Jewish perspective. But um, let me, and here, you know, some of the, the classic challenges that uh, we see in, in certain communities that are not uh, exclusively Jewish, such as uh, uh, environmental issues are belong to the leftists, to the liberals, to the pagans, uh, to the secular, to the Gentiles. These are all barriers into in engaging with, uh, with these types of perspectives. Uh, I wanna focus though on one specific worldview. And that is, uh, and this one is articulated so nicely by uh, Rabbi Israel Rosen, who just passed away this, this past year, uh, who, who writes, and this, uh, this position is, uh, is widely accepted within the world of orth orthodoxy, is that environmental issues are not distinctly halachic. It's difficult to prosecute, to legislate, and one cannot be compelled to uphold ecological norms using halachic coercion. So, you know, within this framework, the idea is, you know, environmental issues are important, and if you're able to act on them, excellent, you're a good person, but they are beyond what's required by halacha. So if, if you are uh, compelled and uh, to, to act from a moral sense, then by all means do so, but it's not halachically uh, um, necessary to, uh, to protect the environment. So what does this position that's quite normative in the world of orthodoxy look like? in decisions. So here's uh, someone who, who some of you will recognize. This is Rabbi Yuval uh, Sherlo, who's actually one of the, uh, the big voices within orthodoxy, uh, speaking about environmental issues. He's one of the founding members of Teva Ivri, uh, a Jewish environmental organization operating out of Israel, and responding to whether Lagba Omer bonfires should be prohibited. He says, that before spending time on finding ways in which to diminish the small connection that children have with their heritage and Hebrew calendar, and before trying to alter halacha, one should act to rectify other considerable environmental issues such as disposable dishes and reducing travel. The issues that arise from burning the bonfires, however, such as damage to human health and the environment are issues that concern halacha, of course. Uh, and the, the bonfires uh, are not halachically mandated, but the consequences of them are. But Sherlow is uh, showing that there's other issues that take precedence over the environmental concerns. And uh, um, in other words, environment is a low priority here relative to education, heritage, national connections. Here's another environmental decision by Rabbi Baruch Efrati, uh, who's been asked whether if one could sell their car, or sorry, if one could buy a car and stop taking public transportation, then uh, is that um, permissible or is the environmental damage that's, uh, that arises from that uh, make it prohibited to, uh, to buy the car? And, Rabbi Efrati answers, as a rule, if there's no direct harm to humans, there's no prohibition against taking the more comfortable mode of transportation, even if there are uh, other slightly less polluting options. And here we again see the low priority of environment in this particular decision. So I wanna throw out a theory and uh, it's, uh, it's still a theory at this stage. There's nothing definitive about it, but uh, I'd like to suggest what the source of this worldview is. And I want to point you to the origins of the Jewish prohibition against wastefulness, Baltashchit, that come in, in Deuteronomy 2019. Here, we see how uh, Israelites are supposed to behave during wartime, not supposed to cut down fruit trees. But you, we see here this whole aspect of you must not destroy, that's the Lotashchit. 
Uh, and then the Y comes in to uh, and shows this separate types of worldviews that uh, that we encounter in the in the interpretations. The one from the NJPS uh, is championed by Rashi. These both, by the way, appear in the Midrash, but this one's championed by Rashi. Are trees of the field human to withdraw before you into the siege city? So you see that there's some sort of compassion to the natural world. The trees are not part of this war. Uh, don't cut them down just for the sake of, um, of troubling your enemy. And uh, the other approach and as championed by uh, Ibn Ezra, uh, it says, you are the tree, the field of the tree. So essentially, the, the tree of the field is the man's life. And so the idea is cutting down the tree is essentially cutting down your food source as, uh, as you take over the city once you conquer it. These two separate worldviews inform how we've come to understand the prohibition of Baal Tashkid. One, on the left, the NJPS is really uh, the, the way in which Baal Tashkid has been championed over the course of history. And I'll just point out to a couple of sources in the, you know, that are formative in the development of Baal Tashkid to illustrate this whole idea of, uh, of righteous behavior um, informing how people act with regards to Baal Tashkid. And so here's an example of Jacob who returns to the camp at the, uh, while his family uh, is running away from Esau, he returns to the camp at great danger to himself. So why did he return? The rabbis say, he remained behind for, some, for the sake of some small jars. Hence it is learnt that to the righteous, their money is dearer than their body. So why is this? Because they do not stretch their hands out to robbery. So the idea that the, the rabbis uh, suggested here is that Jacob left some stuff behind at camp, some trinkets, and he's coming back to, uh, to get those trinkets. Why? Because everything that Jacob gets is divinely bequeathed. It comes from God and the righteous uh, are aware of that. And therefore, even the smallest thing they don't waste. And this is also reflected in the book of moral education, Sefer Chinuch, who is, uh, and the author here is describing what the, uh, what the rationale behind the Jewish prohibition against wastefulness is. And he writes, this is the way of the righteous and people of deeds who love peace and delight in the goodness of human beings and draw them near to the Torah. They do not waste even a grain of mustard in this world. And the idea here is, that, uh, you know, that I'd like to point you to is that what we're getting from this is that righteous people are able to uphold Baal Tashkit, waste not, to the highest standard. In order to do it, you need to be righteous. But most of us, however, of course, are not righteous. Even though we might strive to be righteous, we can't really uphold these things. And... Uh, I think that by focusing on Baal Tashkit, this prohibition against wastefulness as being something that you can only do if you're righteous, you can only do it if you have the ability to uh, elicit compassion for the non-human world uh, is a limited approach if we're talking about um, a way to, uh, to protect the environment. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm now seeing that uh, I'm not speaking quite loud enough. So hopefully I'll now raise my voice a little bit and hopefully it will come through better. In my book, Waste Not, A Jewish Environmental Ethic, I draw the connection between Baal uh, Tashkit, self-harm, and the general prohibition against wastefulness as two things that were intricately connected um, Inter intricately connected uh, earlier in the conceptualization of Baal Tashkit, and the rabbis eventually teased this connection apart and saying that self-harm is one thing and harm to the, or, or destruction of material is something completely different. 
They didn't want to see these things as being connected, even though there is a tradent emerging from the teachings of Rabbi Akiva and kept alive throughout the course of Jewish history that says that if we harm ourselves, uh, sorry, if we harm the environment, in fact, we are also harming ourselves. And I think that prioritizing this particular worldview is something that will enable the decision-making process to shift in the direction of viewing our obligation towards environmental protection as not being only anchored in compassion and righteous acts, but also in one that uh, is in our own self-interest and uh, obligatory from a halachic standpoint. And uh, I'd like to illustrate this through another decision that's made uh, that was given by Rabbi, uh, or the Rav Shmuel Shapira, who was asked if uh, the use of plastics should not be outright prohibited because of the immense destruction that they, uh, that they cause. And he says that if the relevant authorities determined that the use of plastic was harmful to human health, the way cigarettes are, and mandated warnings similar to those that cover cigarette packages, then Jewish law would follow suit and also prohibit the use of disposables. And I want to draw this, uh, you know, e emphasize this essential connection that Rav Shapira draws between the sense of uh, self-harm and harm to human health as the way in which to advance this, uh, this decision-making process. In other words, he's saying that unless we, we associate it with human health, there's no way that we're gonna be able to move forward on this issue. But by doing so, by connecting it back to human health, uh, we can, there is a path forward to addressing these issues from a Jewish perspective. And uh, I hope that, uh, um, that some of this is, uh, is eye-opening to you folks. And uh, I, uh, I think I'll, I'll end here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for your presentation as well. And let me remind everybody, if you have a question to ask the panelists, please feel free to send them to the Q&A or to the chat. I have a few I want to read. Uh, and I'm going to perhaps uh, build off one that I saw asked. It was directed at Ariel, but I think it intersects well with uh, your presentation and, and, and with Ellen's as well. And um, the challenge here, it seems to me, is also the different discourses uh, within the Jewish tradition. And in time, for some, the dominance of the halachic frame as what's determinative, and for others, uh, not. And um, it's interesting to me, and I'm curious in the sense, uh, it's one of them wrote, they wrote to URL was, uh, what do we do with the category of commandedness? Uh, and is that, as opposed to ideas of spiritual values, uh, some kind of midot of being a, a, a virtues we should have, uh, or if we go back to a biblical tradition and story of creation, that's uh, um, maybe, as one of the questioners noted, the Genesis story halachically is read only in terms of the first mitzvah of pruvu, uh, being fruitful and multiply, and the questionnaire, quite one of the questioners asked there, well, that's uh, how does that fit with ecology? If we're supposed to go out and be fruitful and multiply, is that ecologically sensitive? But the rest of the creation narrative is not seen as halachically uh, uh, central in some ways. So it, it strikes me that part of the challenge here is that uh, Jews live in different discourse worlds, and particularly as some of uh, other questioners noted, if you want to reach out to people of other faith traditions who maybe not uh, operate within such a realm of law as being central, what are the challenges uh, that you feel in terms of bringing this rich, diverse tradition to bear on ecological questions? So I'll throw that out to the panel. Maybe I want if you start, and I'll have each of you maybe comment on that, and I'll go to other questions after that. I think you're still muted. Um, thanks everybody for this panel. It was really fun to be part of it. Um, and I'm really happy you're doing this work, Tanhum, because I certainly am not. 
And I think that your question is really great that like my work is really, I, you know, I founded the first Jewish environmental organization and then my work moved more in a biblical direction and a direction of language in order to reach a larger audience. And because I, you know, so that's the, uh, that's the world in which I'm operating now. And um, yeah, so teaching Christians as well. And, uh, and just as uh, Ariel gave us the beautiful work of Zelda, for me, much of Bible is poetry, and that's the realm in which I work. So I'm not, I'm, yeah. So, so, and I think it's great that we're doing different things and we can complement each other's work. Terrific. Uh, Ariel, do you have a... Yeah, uh, thanks so much for that uh, fascinating and important question. Here, I, first of all, I distinguish my own thinking about the categories of halakha and mitzvot from legal formalists or legal positivists who see things in very different terms. I think that they see halakha as roughly a commensurate, at least in terms of its rules of engagement, as it were, with many Western theories of jurisprudence. I come from a tradition that is richly inflected by quests for meaning in which halakha is understood as the path toward the divine, to stand in God's presence with courage, authenticity, and a sense of commitment. And here I find myself much closer to Rosenzweig than to Buber on the nature of the mm -hmm. commandment. I hold on to the commandment, even if I don't believe in an old man in the sky with a big beard who tells me what to do and what not to do. The idea of an obligation, of a commitment to praxis, is front and center to the way in which I live my life as an Orthodox Jew, as an Orthodox rabbi, as a student of martial arts for many years, and as someone who seeks to carry forward what I see as the authentic legacy of Judaism, which speaks, as Robert Cover pointed out and many others, um, perhaps one of the most successful articulations of this I found is in the many works of Eliot Dorf of someone who seeks to find what is the moral and ethical system that undergirds the halakha. And in certain cases, when it comes into contradistinction with modern questions, where it comes into conflict with those, then you have to critique the halakha and you have to rebuild it in certain respects. But it's a dialectic of then moving forward to say, well, perhaps the halakha, which predates the epistemologies and the practices of 21st century America, 21st century Israel, whatever it might be, it predates that with a way of relating to human behavior before carbon capitalism. Perhaps there, there's a critical moral voice that Judaism has to offer, not simply to those that live within the sort of co community of practice at the heart of the halakha, but to those who can listen to that message? Um, uh, those who, who find in the Sabbath, let's say, who are not gonna be particularly bothered to whether or not I can like sort my, my, uh, my silverware and transgress a biblical commandment, but to can say that no, like thinking like Heschel, that the Sabbath is a powerful rebuke to the technological determinism that drew, drove the value system that led to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. There's something incredibly potent there. And it is the language of commandment that I, coming from the Hasidic tradition, and this is something that Reb Zalman talked about all the time, mitzvah is from the language of savta, connected, connection, connectedness, togetherness. It is that practice which binds you to God, binds you to other people, and binds you to the world. And that's the message of Judaism. Thank you. Tanchum, you have something you want to add? I'm sorry, I, I must have missed the question here. Do you, can no, you I was, uh, the question was about the diverse uh, categories of Jew discourse and the challenge of uh, those who limit it to, let's say, halachic uh, formulation, and especially what that poses if you want to speak across uh, religious traditions. Yeah, I, I, sure. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry that uh, I got discombobulated in, in coming across, but I, I think that... Uh, you know, even here at this at this conference, we're we're experiencing an, an incredible diversity of, uh, of voices and approaches to uh, to environmentalism in different Jewish manifestations. I think that uh, that richness is not only um, you know to be celebrated; it is essential because not everyone wants to uh, come to environmentalism. Uh, 
period, if we frame it like that, but uh, you know, not everyone has the same path to, to the end goal. And we have to acknowledge that, but also acknowledge that uh, religious traditions and certainly Judaism are life celebrating traditions. And if we wanna preserve that life, then we have to expand the number of pathways to the end goal of, of achieving uh, uh, sustainable living, flourishing life for, for all, of, uh, all of creation. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here from uh, Ariel Rosenzweig. How might we combat make, uh, magical thinking that allows people into, um, in, into uh, falling into cognitive dissonance and anthropogenic consequences. Obviously, we shouldn't waste time with those who wouldn't listen, but what do we do with our, when our government officials refuse to take a serious look at the problem? I throw that open to any of you who would like to respond to it. Any takers on that particular question? I'm not entirely convinced that it's not worth our time to speak to people that have profoundly different paradigms than we do. And if we think of one of the key questions of our age that has environmental implications, but as we've seen in previous elections and in this election, we live in a country that is not only divided, but it's intolerant of those other anyone who is other than my own particular paradigm and the inability to communicate across differences seems to be an increasing plague in this particular society. And that happens as a kind of isotope on the right. And it happens, there's a versions of this that happen on the left. And so one of the ways to contradict or perhaps move in the direction other than magical thinking is to remain and sustain dialogue with people that have narratives that not only do not agree with our, our own, but compete with and in some ways don't even make room for our own narrative. But to sit together across the table and to be committed to that dialogue is a powerful testament to the way in which we can be on that. Here, I think I'm drawn towards Zelda again. It's the appreciation of small things and small steps in mm -hmm. this moment and to the kind of appreciation of this world, the phenomena and the, not the banal, but the way in which the sacred is manifest through those kind of ordinary moments mm -hmm. that allows me to draw my attention, not to the metaphysics of the four worlds, but to the world and the house plants and the people and the moments that surround me right here and drawing our attention into the present. Yeah, when, when I read the question, it uh, also struck me that uh, the question was posed in terms of pol public policy questions. And, uh, and I'm curious, as uh, you were thinking as either theologians or bringing theological religious thought to bear, uh, is that an arena you find worthwhile to try to operate in, or is it more effective to try to work with uh, people through organizations, through, non through nonprofits, through society, not necessarily uh, through state institutions. And I'm curious from your own experiences, uh, how do you negotiate that? I don't know if Ellen or- uh, Yeah, I can, uh, you know, for me, I write. That's, you know, I write and I produce ritual and that's, and my goal is to engage people and to change the way that people think about our relationship to the land. And, you know, so that's, that's what I feel like I'm bringing. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, so that's, I've carved out this particular niche for myself. Is that out of um, a sense of I'm more effective there or it's pretty tough to work in the, in the policy realm or, or what? I feel like it's about, I feel like we all need to bring our particular gifts and those are mine. I can't think the way that like Tan Hum does about Halifax, right? So I'm not going to ever talk about that, but mm -hmm. this is, so for me, it's the, for me, it's all about, it's poetry, our relationship to, to nature and the land. And, and I feel like the Bible is this beautiful text that we share with so many people. And so for me, it, it's kind of strategic also looking at the ecological dimensions of the Bible and trying to share it as a source of inspiration and mm -hmm. wisdom. 
Ariel, do you, I think you have your hand, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I following Jay Michelson and his call for a kind of Manhattan Project approach to uh, climate change, um, I cannot underscore the importance enough of being engaged in environmental policy and planning at the governmental level. Um, although whether or not that happens at the federal level or the community level, I think is an open mm -hmm. question. And the kinds of change that I think we need to see effective, affected, I have a hard time imagining that the federal government is going to lead us there. I think that it's going to be small groups of people and people who have the courage to think across the semi-permeable membranes of what are traditionally considered the boundaries of community that are going to be able to think beyond that kind of sort of paradigmatic hegemony that we've gotten stuck into. Excellent. At yeah. Tantum, I've noticed you in your own biography, you're working and studying uh, diverse religious traditions. Do you see cooperation extensively among them or are they kind of hermetically sealed and doing their own thing? And maybe the Canadian government different than the US government <laughs> as well. I mean, people have, uh, are, are working together across faiths in, in multiple arenas, whether it's happening to, uh, in, in a broad sense. I mean, usually we, we see the, these spotlighted uh, events and, and occasions and, and it, uh, it, 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 it almost skews our, our perception that this is essentially the, the normative uh, approach within religious traditions to speak about these issues and to deal with them. Uh, but they are the, the tip of the iceberg, even though they, uh, they do receive a lot of attention. Uh, one of the things that I'm very curious about and, and working on in, in my current research projects is how much of that discourse permeates and percolates to the lay communities, to uh, the level of lay community members in places of worship, um, and even local faith leaders, as opposed to the, the national ones who, who get a lot of attention and, uh, and speak to these issues. Uh, mm -hmm. I would also mention something about the, the, the previous conversation. I'm someone who, who's really uh, influenced me positively uh, about sharing um, values with, uh, with people who don't agree with certain uh, aspects of science or uh, or world views is Catherine Hayhoe. And if uh, you haven't checked out uh, her TED talk, uh, you, should, uh, you should absolutely check it out. Uh, she's uh, a devout Christian who uh, is a climate scientist in, at uh, Texas Tech. And uh, she brings um, um, environmental values into communities that, uh, that are vocally opposed to these uh, these issues and talking about finding uh, about coming from a place of shared values and then building the conversation from from that starting point uh, and so uh, there there are multiple pathways so that's one and uh, and profound uh, influence thank you I think I have time for one more comment or question I, I think it's pertinent to what was said here uh, one of our attendees uh, wrote, I'm a member of the Mormon faith and I wanted to attend today. Often I feel frustrated that the leaders of the Mormon church are not, not specifically mentioning uh, the issues of environmental crisis uh, from the pulpit. Do you feel similar, uh, uh, similar about leaders of the Jewish faith? If uh, so, how do, you view, how do you view your role as an activist within your own religious community? I'll talk to that. Um, so for me, you know, there's lots of ways of talking about the environment and issues of the environment. And I actually avoid using environmental, the word environment and environmentalist and climate mm -hmm. because I feel like language is really critical in terms of how reaching people and we can turn people off immediately. They're not gonna to listen to anything we say if they're oriented potentially a different way and they're sick of hearing about climate. And so that's to me, the, that's why I've worked on looking at the Bible itself. And, and I, I believe we can go through every week 
each Parsha and pull out some ecological wisdom. Um, and I imagine that that's true in other faiths as well. I mean, I don't know enough, so I, I can't really say that, but, but that's, that's what I do. And I know, you know, some people have talked, I know I've heard rabbis say we should be talking about climate, you know, one Shabbat a month or whatever. And, and to me, it's like, okay, you know, are people going to listen? Will they come to Shul if they know this is a climate week? So I, I just think it's very important to consider how the language could backfire on you. Yes. Uh, Ariel or uh, Tanhum, any final comments before we wrap up here? Then I'd like to thank the three of you for a very stimulating and thought-provoking session for Chava and the organizers of the conference. I think we have about a five-minute break until we return for our next session. Thank you all. <laughs>